the biological diversity that's created by this, as well as an effective utilization of the materials that we have available in today's marketplace. The bacteria and so forth that's growing in the wetland that we worked so hard to establish gets to stay in there with its water instead of the water back flowing down here and all of it drying out. Cutting all those blocks to blend seamlessly into that stonework to make it look like everything is one cohesive unit. <laughs> Hey, what's up everybody? Ed the Palm Professor here, back in my office. This is a little bit different for me for this particular vlog, and the reason I'm saying that is last week we were in the middle of the recreational pond build. Everything looked great, I thought, but then we had a lot of questions that started popping up regarding a couple of the details that were actually inside of that project. That under subliner drainage system, so that system that evacuates the water from underneath the liner. So there was a lot of questions about that, and I don't think we did a good job of actually filling in some of those details so I want to take a little bit of time out to show you exactly what that is. The other piece that I think we kind of missed on was the act of the wall construction. Now you've seen us setting large boulders, you've seen us putting in all the gravel and the cobblestones and the beaches and the logs and all that type of stuff but we didn't show a lot of the information on that architectural block wall. There's some different things that you have to think about when you're designing it and installing it in a liner type of an installation. So let me kind of go over a couple of these little things that, that I'm talking about. I actually pulled up here the drawing of the Bruggen Pond. So this is that site plan, so it's that overhead view that's showing you that overall layout. So what I want to do real quick is I'm just going to show you exactly where that drainage system actually was designed. So this is that deep area kind of right over in here. So that's the deep spot. So what we did was we started getting water right around this line here. So this whole section was kind of flooded down in the bottom. Had uh, well over a foot of water inside of it. This was a little bit wet over in here, but not too bad. So it was just really, really damp soil. So what we did was we cut a little bit of a trench right down the middle of all this stuff. And then it kind of looped around and it went out over this way and then it went into that sump pit. So that was located on the outside of that screened in area. The reason we did that is we could actually add a pump periodically inside of there. Now you saw the size of that unit. We could actually put a pump in there. We could pump the water out and in fact if the Brugans ever need a source of water on their property they could actually put a pump inside of there and actually utilize some of that groundwater for watering some of their plants and things in and around the property so it's actually kind of nice to have the time you're definitely have to do that is when you ever drain the pond down and the reason I say that is once we take that water out of there we're not going to have the necessary weight on top of everything so what's going to happen is the liner is actually going to bubble up so I did a little bit of a sketch here you can kind of see that little drainage pipe popping out over here. So we put that drainage pipe in and then we actually carved in where that sump pit was gonna go. We had a static water line approximately right over in here. So that was the static water line. Now this is the dry period in Florida. So during the wet period, that water level is actually gonna pop up sub substantially higher, which could be a bigger problem. So which is why we wanted to put all this stuff ahead in the beginning. We put in that drainage pipe, we put a little bit of a trench down on the bottom. So we we dug out a little bit of a pocket, went into this little sump area located over here on the side. This gives us a path of least resistance. So basically what that is, when we have all that weight, when we have all of the weight of all of the entire pond on top of everything pushing down, it's going to force water through this pipe and it's gonna go over into this little sump area. And what's gonna happen is it's actually gonna stabilize right at that same water line. So again, this is all just physics. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out what's actually happening. What are the forces that are happening here? And we wanna resist those forces. So when the pond is full of water, we have positive pressure, one cubic foot of water. A cube of water is 62 pounds. So when you have many, many cubic feet on top of that line, or it's gonna put a lot of pressure down. And when you combine that with all the rock and the gravel and that type of stuff, there's a lot of weight that's actually pushing on top of the liner and that's going to force all of that water over into that sump pit. Now the second thing that I want to describe here is I want to go over that block wall installation. So that architectural block wall is we wanted to have a nice clean look. We wouldn't want to have these massive boulders sitting down on the bottom because this pond was kind of small. So if we put in these large boulders, it's going to take up unnecessary space down on the bottom and it actually takes a 
lot of time to set these up large boulders. We need the equipment. The rocks are very expensive down in Florida, but this block, this concrete block is relatively inexpensive, readily available, and it's quick and easy to install once you have the base material in. Now the problem we had on this project was because of the groundwater. Remember that groundwater was all the way up in here. What was happening when we were building all of this, we dug out a little bit of a trench here. So you can see the excavation just kind of coming down and around. We kind of made a little bit of a depression about six inches deeper than the bottom of the pond. We put in some crushed base material. This is gonna allow us to grade that out and it's gonna provide a stable base for these large blocks to sit on. The problem we had on this project, and we didn't show all these details because this vlog would last for days. <laughs> It'd be a lot, a lot of stuff actually happening. When we put that base material in place, it was actually pushing, being pushed up by the liner. So we had to constantly have our pump running. We were pumping water out from the bottom. We were putting the base in there. We were putting sandbags on top of it and everything to try to create that positive pressure until we were able to build that block wall. That power of water is unbelievable. It's gonna push stuff around, so we have to counteract that. So that's why this is kind of a unique project because we had a couple of these different things happening simultaneously. We put down our heavy layer of fabric, rubber liner, another layer of the fabric. We over-excavated the area right underneath that wall. We put in our crushed base material. We placed the blocks in place. Once those are level, we just start adding the different layers. We are gluing these joints, so in between, all of those blocks. We're actually using a polyurethane adhesive that's going to bind those blocks together to make a big monolithic piece, which is very important from a structural standpoint. Once that wall is in place, we're going to go behind it with either crushed gravel or river rock or something like that. And then we continue with the regular construction of all of our boulders in and around the outside of the pond. So I hope all this stuff made sense. This was that finished look. What I also love about this is these natural boulders so this is the stuff that actually takes time putting in these big boulders and then cutting all those blocks to blend seamlessly into that stonework to make it look like everything is one actually cohesive unit let's go back down to florida pick up with that construction stay tuned We are now coming in and digging out that secondary shelf area, which is gonna tie into that main waterfall. Our next steps will be to install our wetland filter back over in this section, as well as building up the elevations for the water. Tony right now is getting ready to finish up all the intake stuff over here for our pumps. So this system is gonna use external pumps. So the water is gonna get suctioned up from here out to the outside of the pond to the pumps. These check valves are gonna be put in line here and the one-way flapper valve in there, if the power is shut off, it'll still keep water in this line instead of back flowing down. That way when it turns back on, the pumps don't lose their prime. The water's still going right up to the impeller. They can kick back on and just start running. Does right. double duty for them I and it's gonna keep all of that water charged in the pipe system all the way up to the waterfall basically. Good bacteria and so forth that's growing in the wetland that we've worked so hard to establish gets to stay in there with its water instead of the water back flowing down here and all of it drying out. Perfect. All right, looking good. We're gonna drop in the last few rocks along this back edge. You know, this is basically because it's all sand. If we leave this open for another week or so, it's gonna have a high possibility of starting to collapse in. So we're gonna put in a couple more rocks down below. We're gonna leave that edge. The guys are finishing up some of the cobblestones and gravel over in that, that area just to lock up that area for the waterfall. The reason I have to do that is because we have to build that wetland. It's a little bit of a funky project to do it in stages like this. So we have certain things that we have to hit. So we wanna make sure that we have a good structural wall to push all that soil up against.
the flexibility of that liner system. So we're able to manipulate everything, and I said this earlier, we oversized the liner, so we have plenty of material going well beyond the area that we need it. This allows us that artistic freedom to actually set where the rocks look good, and then we could manipulate the excavation to accept everything. It gives us a much more fluid insulation process, and I really think it makes a big difference with the overall look as well. Another thing that I want to stress when I start talking about rubber liners from an environmental standpoint, not only the biodiversity that we're going to have with creating an ecosystem like this, but the carbon footprint of working with a rubber liner. Literally a fraction of the amount of the carbon footprint of a concrete system. So traditional in-ground swimming pools, this would have been done all out of gunite material. You don't have that ability to manipulate the outer perimeter. Once that shell is created, you're done. You're not going to go cutting into that to carve in big boulders like we're doing with this type of an installation. Again, that carbon footprint, I'm always thinking of. This material weighs a third of a pound for every square foot. Now, if you're looking at a concrete style system, and depending upon the thickness of the concrete, I'm just going to say six inches thick for the sake of this discussion. A six inch thick slab of concrete, 12 inch by 12 inch, is going to be about 75 to 80 pounds. So a big difference talking about a carbon footprint is the manufacturing process. The process of creating concrete uses a lot of greenhouse gas type material. So it's using a lot of fossil fuels through the curing process to off gas that limestone. The material that we make our concrete out of is coming from limestone, which is calcium carbonate. So what they have to do is they mine it. So you're going to pull out that raw material. You're going to heat it up and it's going to actually expel a lot of carbon dioxide off into the atmosphere. But I do want to talk about the biological diversity that's created by this, as well as an effective utilization of the materials that we have available in today's marketplace. Years ago, this, this material was not available. It was used in other types of construction. So now we have this material available to us, so we're utilizing it as effectively as possible to create incredible works of art. I'm loving this. We are wrapping everything up. We are heading back to Chicago. We made incredible progress here. You can see we got all the necessary things done that I really wanted to. We got the pond excavated, obviously. We have the liner in place. We have the majority of the stone in. We left a lot of the little edging, a lot of the detail stuff, plant pockets carnivorous plant area. We got to get the pumps in place. We got to get do some more oak croppings and steps, cover up those aqua blocks over in that section. So there's a lot of details that need to be done. Again, this is the whole idea for this project is not only to recreate an incredible environment for our, for our clients down here, but it's also to be used as a training event. We're trying to get a lot of these different things done just so we could touch upon all the different pieces. Here's that area that I was talking about for those carnivorous plants, layer in some geotextile, bring in some sphagnum moss. So that's going to be the perfect perfect environment for that. It is a hollow log, so it's going to be able to fill with water, so it will wick up tons of moisture. The back side of it will have traditional aquatic vegetation, maybe a little bit of a beach area over in here. We still have all these waterfalls that we have to build, so this is going to be our wetland filter. Everything completed for the wetland filter. This is what's responsible for the water quality for the overall project. We have our snorkel vault here, which is highly visible. We have that line of centipede going right down the middle. Over the top of that, we have our aqua blocks. Remember, and I, I can't say this stuff enough, it's all about sedimentation removal as well as distribution of water. High velocity water coming in on one end, it's gonna come in through this pipe right here. It's gonna get discharged right into the bottom. It's gonna spread itself out very evenly. And then that water is gonna take approximately 10 minutes to fill those aqua blocks. So it's gonna be very, very slow. It's gonna allow sedimentation process to occur. Then the water is gonna to start to come into contact with the layer of river rock. Once it hits the river rock, it will slowly migrate its way up through all that rock and gravel, which is going to be home to different types of microorganisms. So they're part of the nitrification cycle. They're also responsible for carbon cycles. So they are very unique organisms. We are going to seed them. And what I mean by that is we're going to actually add them into the pond over by the pumps. It will become distributed all throughout the bottom, and then those organisms will find, make a home inside of this filter bed. Water is going to flow up through all that material, and we'll have decorative rocks and things around the end, and then we're going to have our waterfalls cascading out. So we're at a really, really good place here. Our next step is to cover all of this with those small cobblestones, then we'll come in with the layers of the big river rock. Then we'll top it off with a layer of small river rock. 
which is going to be responsible for the aquatic plantings. Everything's really coming together. This is going to be a wrap. So, as always, we got a flight to catch. <laughs> so we are going to be cleaning ourselves up, getting out of here, and then I will be back here in about 10 days to see this project through. All right, we'll see you soon. Yeah.